This is part two of our solutions molarity and equilibrium review. I only got to question 20 last time, so we'll start right there. And question 20, it says we've got 100 milliliters of a 0.8 molar solution of hydrochloric acid. We're diluting it, so um, this is what our, this is going to be molarity one. This is going to be volume one and we're diluting it to two liters so that's going to be volume two and so what we're looking for we need to know what's going to be the molarity of the more concentrated that's going to be number two so this is what we're looking for right there and we've got molarity one times volume one is equal to molarity two times volume two and let's see we need to rearrange this equation to solve for volume two and so we got to divide both sides by volume two. It cancels out. So molarity one is going to be 0.8 molar. We're going to multiply that by volume one, 200 milliliters. And then we're going to divide that one by, let's see, um, volume two, which is two liters. Now, okay, now since we've got milliliters up here, I need to make this one into milliliters, which will be 2,000 milliliters. Now, if you wanted to leave this at 2 liters, then you would have had to change this one to 0 0.2 liters. And then you can do your own calculations there to get that. Now, next problem here. If the percent by volume is 3%, okay, so now we're going to just say we already know we got a 3% solution, and that's going to be equal to... And let's see, the volume of the solution, so they're telling us the solution's volume, which goes in the denominator, 350 milliliters. And they want to know what's going to be the amount of solute. I'll just call it X grams. We need to make you multiply that by 100. So to solve this problem, you are going to have to rearrange this equation. You're going to have to multiply both sides by 350, divide both sides by 100, so you're going to have 3 times 350, then you have to divide it by 100. So you can do your own math there. Number 23, the percent by mass is 5%. So another problem, they told us we got 5%. And it says the mass of the solution is 500 grams. So once again, we've got 500 grams down here. What is the mass of the solute? We're looking for how many grams up here. And we need to remember, we need to multiply by 100%. So just like in the previous problem, you're going to have to do 5% times 500. And then you got to divide it by 100. And that will tell you how many grams of solute there is. Number 24. Percent by volume ethanol, so we need to find that. So we're looking for percent volume. It tells us we have 65 milliliters of solute. And they say we've diluted it to, now when you read the problem, this 65 milliliters is diluted to 225. So that's telling us this is the new volume of the solution, 225 milliliters. And now i got to times that by 100%. And at this point, you can do your math. The main thing is, this problem says we've diluted it to a new solution volume, and that's it right there. So you don't need to add these two numbers together down there. How is percent by volume calculated? Well, I've just shown you right here. It's going to be the grams of solute divided by grams of solution. I'll abbreviate that, times 100%. And percent, whether it's percent mass or volume, well, this would be percent. Okay, I guess, sorry, that should be milliliters if we're doing by volume. Okay, so the next one here, we need to... Which solid is most soluble at 60 degrees? Okay, so we're going to take a look at our solubility chart here. And at 60 degrees, the solid... And we're going to do the solid line, so 60 degrees. Okay, of what's on the chart, sodium nitrate, you could probably figure that actually potassium iodine would, would, that would continue. But as far as data that's on the chart, the most soluble at 60 degrees 
is going to be sodium nitrate and most likely potassium iodide up there. Sodium nitrate. And you can infer that potassium iodide would. And then it says, what's least soluble at 60 degrees? Now, there's, we're still talking about which solid. So looking at our chart here, at 60 degrees, the least soluble one is going to be KClO3. KClO3. If the question was asking about gases, we would have used the dotted lines. Okay, we're on the back side now. How many grams of KNO3 can be dissolved in 300 grams of water at 50 degrees? Well, so first off, you're going to use this chart. We're going to see how much can be dissolved in 100 grams because that's what this chart tells us. Grams dissolved in 100 grams. So for KNO3, let's see, there's KNO3 right there at 50 degrees. I'm going to come over here to the chart and I'm going to go up to KNO3. It looks to me like it's about 85 grams. So about 85 grams can be dissolved per 100 grams. So now we want to set up a proportion. Now let's say we have 300 grams of, of solution. What's that going to be? Now you just solve for X, which would involve multiplying both sides by 300. Those cancel out and it'll be 300 times 85 divided by 100. And that'll tell you what the answer will be there. See, number 31, which compound shows the greatest increase in solubility as the temperature increases from 0 to 100? So, let's see. We want the greatest increase in solubility between 0, which is going to be the steepest line. And it looks to me like the steepest line on here. It looks like it's KNO3. Because I think if I kind of try to make an average, that line's more or less like this if we were to do a regression analysis of it, is what they call it in statistics. All the other lines are a little flatter, but this one, pretty steep. So it looks like between 0 and 100. Now this one, you can infer that it's going to keep on going. I'm going to say that it's probably KNO3. Now if you looked at that and said, well, wait a minute, there's only of the one that goes all the way from 0 to 100 on the full chart. So it would look like, I don't know, it looks like it's going to be one of these three right here if you just want to focus on the ones that go completely on the chart. And it looks to me like, I don't know, see that st steep of that line. I'm thinking probably this one would be the steepest, but right there, potassium nitrate, the greatest. Number 32. So for at 40 degrees Celsius, 80 grams of NaNO3 are dissolved in 100 grams of water. Okay, so we're just going to write that down. We've got 80 grams dissolved in 100 grams of water. Now, the question is saying, is this going to be saturated or unsaturated? So let's take a look on the chart. At 40 degrees, let's see what saturation is. So saturation is read right off the chart. So for NaNO3, here's NaNO3, and our temperature again is 40 degrees. You come up here to 40 degrees, and it looks like it's going to be about 100 and maybe about 103, 102 grams. So 103 grams can be dissolved in 100 grams according to our chart. So that's what the saturated solution would be. And since this one is a lot less, we would say this is an unsaturated solution. Unsaturated. Okay, number 33. A saturated solution of ammonium chloride is formed from 100 grams of water. Okay, we have there's ammonium chloride. So we'll be looking at this one on this chart. If the saturated solution is cooled from 70 to 50 degrees Celsius, how many grams will precipitate or crystals will form? So what you do is you go to 70 degrees on the chart, and at 70 degrees, let me make sure I'm getting the right one, we're doing um, NaNO3 this time. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on this problem, I was looking at the right, uh, ammonium chloride. So we're doing this one, so I go to 70 degrees, and at 70 degrees, it looks like it's just over. 60 grams. 
remember doing this one in class with you all. 61 grams can be dissolved per 100 grams at 70 degrees. At 50 degrees, so now if you let that solution cool down, some of those crystals cannot stay dissolved anymore. And according to this chart, it looks like that's 50 grams can be dissolved at 50 degrees Celsius. So we got 50 grams per 100 grams. So you got to subtract those two and you'd get 11 grams of crystals would form. Number three, what are the three things that increase the rate of solution? This is from our lab right in there. Increase the temperature, increase stirring, and let's see, we'll increase the rate of solution, decrease the size of the crystal. because all of those will end up acting to make more little collisions happening on the chunk of material. If this is a, a grain of some type of salt, if you increase the temperature, you get more water hitting this to make it dissolve. If you increase stirring, same thing, you get more water hitting this, allowing it to dissolve. If you make this particle smaller, it doesn't take as much time for the dissolving process to completely take that away. If you have a big giant crystal like that one, um, it's going to take a lot longer for water to dissolve that away. So small crystals dissolve and become solutions very quickly. Why does stirring increase the rate of solution? Well, I just talked about it here because you're increasing the amount of particles hitting this. You're getting more collisions of water with this stuff to make it dissolve. So uh, it increases collisions. And these collisions aren't causing a chemical reaction, but every little collision takes a chunk out. So if you stir more and more, you're getting more chunks out and they're going to dissolve that a lot quicker. Number 37. Why does increased surface area increase the rate of dissolving? You know what? Increased surface area increase the rate of dissolving. I'm going to go right down right here. It's all the way down to question 52. So we're going to answer those two together. So here's increased surface area. Here's small surface area. And so the question we want to know, why is this one going to dissolve quicker? Which one would dissolve first? This one. Dissolves fast. We'll say faster. And what I'd like to do is I like to use uh, the, the burrito analogy. Let's say you went to a party and they had a tray of those little mini burritos. Love those. And then your buddy shows up to the party and they've gone over to Chipotle and they brought their great big monster burrito. So let's assume now if, if let's say that eating your burrito is going to be analogous to water dissolving this. So let's say you're taking about two bites a minute of your burrito. Well what's going to happen is probably a couple bites, probably in about four bites that little burrito can be gone. But in the same amount of time, you've hardly made a dent on this big one. It would take many, many more minutes of little bites working on this to get this burrito eaten, which would be the same as every little moment, every little collision on a small crystal is taking parts away. But on a big crystal, you're going to need a whole bunch more of those little parts, those little collisions to pull this away. And so a huge surface area like this crystal is just going to take a lot longer to eat, just like it takes a lot longer to eat a cherry compared to an apple. It's okay, just going to take a lot longer to do that, to eat a cherry than an apple because you just got more stuff that has to be worked on. Okay, I'm coming back to number, now equilibrium problems, number 38. Why does a higher temperature cause the reaction to go faster? More collisions. You make the temperature higher, you get more particles moving around faster and you get more collisions and that makes chemical reactions go quicker. Why does higher concentration make the reactions go faster? Well, if we got two containers here and we've got a whole bunch of chemicals in there and very few in here, these guys are just bumping in, making collisions constantly. Imagine you've got 20 of your friends in a closet. If you've only got four of you in that same size volume, you're not going to be, you know, the, you're going to be bumping once in a while. 
but if you have more particles, you get more collisions. So, more collisions. Hopefully, I didn't go off the page there. At equilibrium, what is the rate of production of reactants? Here's the reactants on the left side. Compared with the rate of products, we can use our compound A plus compound B is changing into the products called AB. Oop, AB, sorry. If you're at equilibrium, that means, well, this is a reversible reaction. Once it gets to equilibrium, that means the same amount of compound A is breaking down through decomposition into A and B, and A and B are forming, synthesizing AB at the same rate. And that was like when we did our, our water lab in class to start this unit. When you got to the point that both your containers of, of uh, chemicals were that you were dumping from one container to the other, remember that lab, you're going back and forth. So at, once you got equal amounts, when you, when you got to equilibrium, you had the same amount of, of reactants and products going back and forth. If a reaction is reversible, what are the relative amounts of reactant and product? Well, it depends. So we did one of the activities where I think we had you use a big container and a little container. Excuse me, yeah, a big, gradu a big beaker and a little beaker. So what tended to happen when you started mixing these, the big one, you probably ended up having more liquid over here and a little bit over there. But, so at one point, so in this case, we would say that the, the products are being favored over there. But at some point, we reached a point where equilibrium was reached, where at the end, even though you had a great big beaker, it was very little amount of it was pouring in, and your little beaker was probably full. When you reached equilibrium, these levels stopped changing. But before that happened, you, might, you, you, you ended up possibly having one of these having more. So it kind of depends, and I don't think I'm going to ask that on the test for you. If sulfur dioxide, that's SO2, and oxygen, plus O2, can be made into sulfur trioxide, okay, so that's the reaction. What's the reverse reaction they want to know? Okay, well, just this one here. It's that way, which that's the only one that sulfur, two, and I didn't balance the equation here, but you got sulfur dioxide changing, excuse me, Sulfur trioxide is now breaking down into these two. Okay, if we've got this reaction right here, I think just about every class we went over this one. Um, what's the effect of decreasing the volume? Now, if you decrease the volume of a container, so here's a container, and you make it smaller, that means you're squishing it down, and that's going to make the pressure get higher. You feel that when you try to squeeze a water bottle full of air that you've got it sealed on. So what we need to do is we need to take a look at over here. And this is a gas. We got one mole of this gas, and we've got three moles of this gas. So altogether, we have four moles of gas over here. Over here, we only have two moles of gas. So I like doing visuals. This would be a bubble this big. This would be a smaller bubble. And if we started to squeeze this container, this, this little system, let's say we, these were somehow connected, which they are through the reaction, if you started to squeeze this by you know, increasing the pressure, you're going to start forcing. This balloon is going to start pushing contents over here, and that will make the equation go to the right. So that would be the effect here. If you increase the pressure on this system, it's going to take these where you have a lot of moles of chemicals, it's going to reduce it to smaller moles of chemicals. Number 44. What happens to reactions at equilibrium when more reactant is added? Okay, reactants change into products. We'll have A plus B change into AB. If you add more reactant, okay, we add a whole bunch more of A's over here. That's kind of like adding a whole bunch, if this is our balance scale, we've added a whole bunch of things on this one. You're gonna have to push chemicals this way to get it back to balanced. So that's going to make the reaction shift to the right. And at some point, then it'll equal out and you'll be at equilibrium. Number 45, almost done with this. You'll have quite a few, several questions on this one. Which of these changes listed would make the equilibrium shift to the right? Okay, I'm just going to put a big arrow. We want to know 
Which of those is going to make things go to the right? Now, if we add chlorine to this, well, if you whatever side you add stuff to, we add chlorine here, it's going to push it this way. If you like the balance equation, if you add a bunch of chlorine here, this gets out of balance, and it's going to shift the reaction to the left. So it's not that one. If you remove oxygen, now if you take oxygen away, I say it creates a hole in the reaction and these chemicals are going to react to try to fill it, shifting to the left. If you prefer the balance scale, if you take something away from this side of the balance, it pops up like this. You've got to shift things to the left to get it, so it's not that one. Now we've got pressure. Well, let's see, we've got four moles of gas plus one mole of gas, so we've got five moles of gas here bubble that big. Here we've got two moles of chlorine gas plus two moles of water as a gas, so that bubble is going to be a little bit smaller, four moles. And we want the reaction to go to the right, and it looks like if you squeeze this reaction, if you increase the pressure, it's going to push these five moles towards becoming only four moles of chemicals, and that is going to increase in the pressure is going to be our answer. If you were to make the pressure smaller, it would have the effect of this one's going to go to this direction. Activation energy on a graph. Okay, activation energy is the energy you need to start the reaction. Energy to start a reaction. It's the energy when you strike a match, the energy you add by sliding the match over. The energy when you put a match to a bunch of piles of wood, okay? So what happens is you've got, this is energy on the graphs. If you've got an energy level, you've got your reactants over here. Well, you've got to add a lot of times a little bit of energy to get it going. And once you add that energy, you put the match by the pile of wood on your camp trip. Now the reaction starts going all by itself. And it'll, all the energy that the reactants had will eventually be released. And then you end up over here with your products at a lower energy. And this area right here, this is the activation energy you need. Activation energy. It's the amount of energy you needed to add to this. All right, very good. Bye-bye, everybody.